Hello, I'm Rachel Spears. I'm the Executive Director of Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta, here to talk to you today about fiscal sponsorships. Uh, first, I'd like to take a moment to tell you a little bit about our organization. We provide free legal services to nonprofit organizations. We don't represent the clients, we represent the nonprofit or organization itself with its business legal needs, ranging from revising bylaws to registering a trademark to drafting employee policies reviewing contracts um, and leases, that sort of thing. Uh, we pr uh, match nonprofit organizations with volunteer attorneys from corporations and law firms here in Atlanta. If you'll flip over, I'll talk about eligibility a little bit. Uh, in order to be eligible, uh, you must be a 501c3 nonprofit organization. You must be located in or um, serve the greater Atlanta area, and um, most importantly, serve low-income or disadvantaged individuals and um, be unable to afford legal services. Most of our clients are smaller community-based nonprofits. You can find out more about us on our website, um, pbpatl.org. And um, you can also go there and get resources. We have um, monthly these free webinars. We have workshops here in Atlanta. We have lots of resources on the website itself, so please feel free to visit. And while there, you're there, you can even make a donation. Um, all right, let's talk about our topic here today. I'm going to start with a question, what is a fiscal sponsor? Um, a fiscal sponsor is a tax-exempt entity, an organization that already has its 501c3 status, that agrees to accept donations on behalf of, on behalf of a non-tax-exempt entity, so an organization that does not have its 501c3 status. Um, there are two important points I want to make before I get into more detail. Number one, the organization acting as fiscal sponsor has to retain supervision and control of those funds. They cannot just act as a pass-through. Um, the IRS has made that very clear. They have to have control of those funds. Um, and second, the fiscal sponsor has to ensure that those funds that are used in a manner that's consistent with their own mission. Whatever charitable purpose that um, that 501c3 was approved for when they got their uh, tax exempt status from the IRS, um, the purpose that the project is using these funds for must be consistent with the sponsor's mission, and we'll talk in more detail about that. First, let's go to the slide, why have a fiscal sponsor? Um, the benefits to um, a project that uses a fiscal sponsor are pretty obvious. The, the most obvious one are that they can receive tax-deductible donations. So a group wanting to start up a project with some sort of a charitable purpose in order to be successful, it's going to be really important for them to be able to bring in donations. And the amount of those donations and the number of those donations um, are going to be greater if those donations are tax deductible. So by running these through, um, by having a fiscal sponsor, um, you're going to be able to do that. Um, but there are other benefits as well. Um, if a program is very small and doesn't have a lot of infrastructure, they can benefit from the services, other services that the fiscal sponsor might provide such as um, if they have a staff um, that can help manage some of this stuff, they can handle the bookkeeping and other administrative tasks, and even help with some of the fundraising. Um, another benefit is that a lot of donors, um, foundations, and even individual donors are going to be wary of funding an organization that has just started up, that doesn't have a track record, you know, proven success. So by coming under a fiscal sponsor, you may be able to alleviate some of that wariness. And finally, it adds some credibility. If you're coming up under a fiscal sponsor that does have that history and track record, it immediately adds something to your brand new organization. So the next question is, who should use a fiscal sponsor? Um, these are groups that are starting, as I mentioned, to do some sort of a charitable purpose, um, but have, you know, some concerns. Maybe they're unsure if it's going to be viable. Um, they're not sure if whatever project they are developing is going to receive the funding necessary to keep it going. Rather than running out and starting a new 501c3 nonprofit organization and going through all that and paying those fees, you might want to do this as an initial step to find out, is this going to receive support in the community, both financial support, volunteer support, et cetera, that you need to keep going. Um, groups intending to operate only for a short time. I just spoke to someone recently that has a project and they basically just do this project once a year and my advice to them was to consider a fiscal sponsorship rather than running out and starting a new 501c3 organization if this project is only going to be one day a year um, 
once you're a 501c3, you have administrative burdens that last year round, and that may be more than they want to take on. Uh, groups lacking administrative experience, as I mentioned, you can benefit from some of the administrative services that a fiscal sponsor might provide. And finally, um, and I haven't really touched on this, this isn't the focus of what we're doing, but these are very common in the arts um, fields, in um, independent filmmakers and other artists uh, often come up under a fiscal sponsor in order to be able to get tax deductible grants and donations for their projects. That's not our focus here today, but I'll mention that it's very common. So if you are a project that has decided that fiscal sponsorship is right for you and is something you want to try, there are several things you need to look for in um, selecting that fiscal sponsor. The most important thing is that they have a similar mission. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, in order to satisfy the IRS, um, the funds that come in through the fiscal sponsor to the, spon to the project must be used in a manner consistent with the mission of the fiscal sponsor. So let's say you want to start a community garden and you know somebody who runs a free medical clinic. Um, you're not going to be able to use that free medical clinic most likely as your fiscal sponsor because your missions are not consistent. Um, they're going to get in trouble with the IRS for using their funding which should be used for medical purposes um, if it's diverted to something that's not related to that. So you need to have a similar mission. You also want to look for somebody that has maybe a history of acting as a fiscal sponsor, um, certainly is very interested in doing it because this is a long-term kind of um, relationship and you want somebody who knows what they're getting into and is comfortable with it. You want to make sure this organization has uh, sufficient financial resources and staff to be able to manage this fiscal sponsorship relationship. Um, they're taking a lot um, on themselves to do this. And you don't want somebody that doesn't have any staff or maybe one staff person that really needs to focus on their own mission rather than trying to help with yours. Um, you want to look for somebody with a history of support from funders, preferably, and with strong policies and procedures. Um, the funding that's coming into your project is going through this other organization. You want to make sure they have good financial policies, internal controls, so that that money is handled appropriately. Um, I want to talk in a little bit more detail about the services that may be provided by a fiscal sponsor beyond just um, taking in the tax deductible donations. Uh, first of all, financial services, um, bookkeeping, keeping up with the records, sending out the acknowledgments to your donors. These are things um, that can be administrative burdens and for an organization that just wants to focus on the true mission and not sort of be sidelined by these things, that's something that your fiscal sponsor may be able to um, it may be appropriate for them to handle in many situations. Uh, insurance, depending on how you are structuring um, this arrangement, you may be able to come up under the insurance policies of your fiscal sponsor. Insurance is a really important thing that people overlook. Um, starting with general liability insurance, maybe directors and officers liability insurance, you want to talk to a good broker, make sure you have the coverage you need, and consider um, uh, again, coming up under the fiscal sponsor if that's appropriate. Next, Human Resources Administration. Uh, if you are going to have paid employees, there's a lot that goes along with that. Anybody that's ever run payroll knows that. Um, and you can have uh, your staff basically be employees of that other organization or create some other structure where they can help you with payroll, with um, if you want them to have insurance, have some of the benefits where they'd actually be employees of the fiscal sponsor. There are lots of different ways to arrange that. Uh, and just general administration, um, which you can turn over to this other organization taken off your plate. Uh, I've got a few more on the next page. Um, well, these are benefits to the sponsor. I've talked up till this point more about the benefits to the project, the organization that's engaging a fiscal sponsor, but we're turning now to talk about um, the fiscal sponsor itself. What are the benefits and the risk that they face? Um, well, there are potential benefits. First of all, um, they may attract new donors because of this project. They, people get excited about the project and want to support actually the fiscal sponsor. Um, if the project is successful, they can sort of take some of the credit for that and maybe help them in the PR area. And for a um, fiscal sponsor that wants to expand their mission and do more than they're able to do right now, a project may enable them to do that. 
um, to bring in the funding and the volunteers and resources necessary to really expand their reach. Um, that's what I see the reason a lot of um, organizations get into this fiscal sponsorship arrangement. Now, of course, I want to talk about the risk to the sponsor because there are definitely some to consider. Um, first of all, liability. Uh, anytime you have an arrangement with this project under your organization, there's potential liability there. Um, it's something you'll want to address and we'll discuss later in your fiscal sponsorship agreement how to handle that. And you'll want to you know, think about insurance and other things to protect yourself from those risks, but they're, they are there. Um, so something to keep in mind. Uh, you will be held accountable for the use of all the donations, so the money that um, comes through you and is ultimately um, used for the benefit of the project, the fiscal sponsor is ultimately responsible for those and will be held accountable by the IRS um, for those. So you're taking on um, a, a great deal of responsibility there and again you want to make sure you have the capacity to have that oversight. Ultimately your tax exempt status is in jeopardy here. Um, the project that's using you doesn't have 501c3 status. You know, they're not under the control of the IRS in this situation. You are. Um, so if those funds are not used properly, if um, something happens with the project, ultimately your 501c3 status is on the line. Um, and I mention all that not necessarily to scare organizations away from doing this, but to make sure that they know what they're getting into before they take this step. Um, and, and it's not a good idea for startup organizations, for brand new 501c3 organizations to act as fiscal sponsor for all of these reasons. Um, a lot of my clients maybe have recently gotten their 501c3 status or haven't had it for very long. They might have one person working for them who's maybe not even paid. They really need to spend all of their time focusing on their own mission um, and their own fundraising and their own things. This isn't a good idea for a brand new 501c3. But a more established 501c3 that has staff, that maybe has a little bit more capacity, um, this is something they may be able to take on. So if you're a project considering approaching a fiscal sponsor, or if, you've been, um, you're, if you're a 501c3 that's been asked by a fiscal sponsor, you need to be really honest about whether you have the capacity um, to do that. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the pros and cons for the project, the, um, the group using the fiscal sponsor. We've touched on the pros. Uh, it allows the project to focus on the program itself. You know, a lot of people come to me wanting to start a 501c3 organization, and in talking to them, what's truly, they're passionate about the mission. They're passionate about running an after-school program for girls, or, um, you know, feeding the homeless, or whatever it is. And when you start talking to them about what's involved in running a 501c3 organization, and some of the administrative details, and the filing requirements, and the keeping up with the IRS regulations, that's clearly not what they're interested in. Um, by engaging a fiscal sponsor, it allows you to focus on the mission, the stuff you're really passionate about, um, and then consider later whether you want to take on the other burdens as well. Um, as we mentioned, having an established fiscal sponsor will lend some credibility to your program. Um, you'll find being a startup um, organization, you're going to get some suspicion from funders and donors and other people who really, as I mentioned before, want to see um, a track record and by engaging a fiscal sponsor that gives you a little bit of a leg up. You also get benefit from the guidance and support of that sponsor. And um, finally, if you're taking on this project and it's not you're not getting the support that you were hoping for um, or things come up and you just realize you're not going to be able to continue with this, um, it's very easy to terminate. You don't have to go through the process of um, dissolving the organization, you know, terminating with that, um, letting the IRS know, all of that stuff. It's very easy to just end it right there without a lot of expenses either. Um, now there are some cons to consider for the project. Uh, there is a loss of autonomy. The fiscal sponsor has to have um, some sort of supervision, has to ultimately have control of the funds, and you're giving up that. Um, but you have to keep in mind the, on the other side the bene huge benefit you're getting. Um, and it's just a cost-benefit analysis that you have to go through and see what makes sense for your organization. Also keep in mind that while um, with some funders you're going to get a leg up because you have um, a fiscal sponsor, um, there are some foundations that refuse to give through, through fiscal sponsorship arrangements. So you need to find out what are your most likely sources of funding and um, would 
fiscal sponsorship work in that arrangement. If there are some funders you're planning on going to, talk to them. See if this arrangement would work or if they'd prefer for you to get your phone 501c3. You know, kind of talk about that before you even go down this path. All right, as I mentioned before, it's really vital to get a written agreement in place before you set up this fiscal sponsorship um, arrangement. You can avoid a lot of hassles and misunderstandings down the line if you get all this laid out in advance. Each party is taking on different responsibilities, different obligations. You want to lay that out in advance so that everybody's on the same page um, and, like I said, to avoid some problems down the road. There are lots of different ways to structure this, but there's a few topics that you want to make sure is are covered whichever way you go. First of all, is the project going to be incorporated or not? Um, incorporation is separate from your 501c3 status. This is getting set up um, as like a nonprofit corporation here in Georgia. You'd be set up with the Secretary of State office as a nonprofit. Um, you want to ask, do you want the project to get incorporated? And you can go either way with this. For me, advising my clients acting as fiscal sponsors, um, I like to see the project be incorporated because otherwise you have a written agreement with this entity that's not incorporated and I'm not sure um, in, under Georgia law how binding that would be. Um, and so I like to see them incorporated, but there are some national fiscal sponsorship organizations that act as basically their mission is to act as fiscal sponsors and they don't like to see the project incorporated. They just want it to be um, a group of individuals. So you want to see um, which way is appropriate in your circumstance and lay that out. Um, you want to ha definitely have some provisions covering the funds. Um, once the funds come in, are they going to be held in a separate bank account? How are the funds going to be dispersed from that bank account? Are you going to have sort of a check request process? Um, what, how do you expect those funds to be released to the project? You really want to lay that out in advance and make sure it works for your organization. Uh, type and frequency of reporting, as I said, they've got to have oversight. So what do you expect this reporting by the project to look like? Um, how often do you want to see that? You want to make sure as the fiscal sponsor that you have sufficient oversight that you're getting these reports um, enough so you can really know what's going on. Uh, when it comes to grants, you may be, uh, the fiscal sponsor of the project may be applying for grants jointly, or um, the project may be applying for grants and need information from the fiscal sponsor, like financial reports and stuff like that. You want to really lay out the responsibilities for that, who's responsible for putting those grants together, who's responsible for the follow-up reporting with the foundations. You want to cover any other support provided by the sponsor. Some of these administrative things that I mentioned before, you can look to for the fiscal sponsor. What are you expecting them to do? Um, and of course, the more you expect them to do, as we'll mention later, sort of the more a cost to the project. And you want to lay all that out. Um, you also want to cover the issue of lobbying. Uh, 501c3 organizations are limited in the amount of lobbying that they can do. And for a fiscal sponsor, any lobbying that the project does under them is going to be attributed to the fiscal sponsor. So as the fiscal sponsor, you want to lay out in there, if you do any lobbying, we need to know about it so we can sort of calculate it um, along with ours. Or um, if you want to be conservative about it and not let them do lobbying, you need to lay that out in advance. Um, along with lobbying comes question of, let me just mention political campaigning, um, because no 501c3 can do anything that resembles political campaigning, um, supporting or opposing a candidate for public office. So it's a good idea to lay out in the fiscal sponsorship agreement that the project cannot do any of that, um, because if they do, it's the fiscal sponsor's 501c3 status that is jeopardized. Uh, tax reporting, you want to make sure that these funds coming in are reported somewhere on a tax form. Um, most likely it's going to be on the fiscal sponsor's 990 form, um, but you want to lay that out in advance um, where that's going to show up and if along with that if you're doing audits and you need to include this money in the audit there may be some increased cost to the fiscal sponsor and you want to make sure that's accounted for. 
And speaking of cost, um, it raises the very common question of administrative fees. Uh, in my opinion, it's very appropriate for a fiscal sponsor to receive an administrative fee um, for acting as a fiscal sponsor. Typically, you'll see it as a percentage. So a percentage of the funding coming into the project is retained by the fiscal sponsor to cover their expenses, their expenses of supervision, um, their expenses for any other administrative tasks that they take on. Um, frankly, to cover the risk they are taking on to their own 501c3 status by acting as a fiscal sponsor. A lot of people ask me about what's an appropriate uh, fee, and you definitely see a range in this, um, 5 to 10 percent, 5 to 12 percent. Whether that's on the high or the low end really comes down to what all is the fiscal sponsor doing for the project? Are they just um, taking in the tax deductible donations and doing what they need to do with respect to that, or are they also adding on some of these admi other administrative tasks, which would obviously push it up to the higher end? Rachel? Yes. One viewer asks, is there an agreement template? Uh, you know, there are some available online that I have seen that are pretty good. Um, I really encourage when it comes down to just about anything to not just rely on finding something on a website and changing it to fit you really try to engage an attorney to help you through this process preferably an attorney with some experience in this um, for those of you here in Atlanta we can help with this and um, in other cities try to find a pro bono attorney in another organization like ours um, that can help you th think through all of these issues um, because what you're really trying to do is anticipate what could go wrong, and an attorney can really help you do that. There's one more. Okay. It says, we have several sponsored projects that are registered with the state and have a federal ID number. Do we need to identify on our audits or 990s which federal ID numbers fall under ours, or do the projects need to file something declaring that they are covered as elsewhere? Okay, I need you to show that to me. I'm a visual person. <laughs> All right, several sponsored projects. I'm assuming you're the fiscal sponsor with projects under you. Um, so these projects are incorporated and have their own federal ID number. Okay, um, I think that's probably something to talk to an accountant about. I think you can probably include those projects on your 990. Um, whether the projects themselves have to file something separately with the state um, is another question. Their, you know, all the money coming into that project is really not their money. Um, the money is the fiscal sponsor's money, so it's appropriate to show up in the 990. So the project itself technically has no money. So they have no money, nothing to show on um, like a tax return. So maybe they file a tax return with just zero it out. Um, but that's something I would check with an accountant about. That's all. Thanks. Okay. And feel free to add any more questions. All right, a few more things about fiscal sponsorship agreements. Uh, you want to, if you're going to have paid staff, you want to um, cover whether those staff will be employees of the project or of the fiscal sponsor. Um, again, you can go either way with this, but you want to make sure this is laid out. The, one of the most important pieces of this is make sure somebody's paying the payroll taxes. Um, that's kind of another total webinar, but I'm seeing so many nonprofits face the issue getting, um, whether it's the IRS or the Department of Labor coming down on them for not paying payroll taxes. You want to make sure somebody is covering that. Um, and again, they can be employees of the fiscal sponsor that are simply working on the project, um, or you can have them staffed separately by the project. Uh, you want to discuss the level of supervision and control. As I said, there's going to be some level. It's just a matter of um, you want to detail exactly what that supervision and control is going to look like as far as oversight. Uh, you definitely want to cover insurance, as we discussed before, who's going to be responsible for the insurance coverage, who's going to and make sure you've got that paid for somehow. And also cover liability and indemnification issues. Um, it's entirely appropriate for particularly the project to indemnify um, the fiscal sponsor in the agreement so that if the fiscal sponsor um, has faces some sort of um, cost 
um, or a lawsuit or something because of the acts of the project, the project is going to be responsible for reimbursing them for those costs. Um, it's a good idea to get all that laid out up front. Um, next, this is a really important issue, or can be, ownership of anything developed by the project. Um, could be tangible or intangible. The project could be something that's maybe developing curriculum. Um, we mentioned earlier that filmmakers use this a lot, so they maybe develop, may come up with a film, or they may create this great brand that has value in itself, the name or the logo, you know, that can be used in fundraising. You want to address the question, who owns that? Um, since it's under a fiscal sponsorship arrangement, is that the property of the fiscal sponsor, or is it going to be the property of the project? Because ultimately, this relationship is probably going to end, and you need to figure out up front who's going to own anything that comes out of it. Um, and finally, the duration um, and termination of the agreement. Uh, if this is a kind of a temporary situation for a project that is applying for 501c3 status, you probably want to provide that it terminates when the project gets its 501c3 status, or it may be a set amount of time, a year, or it may be an ongoing arrangement that you want to be able to continue and, you know, have either party sort of terminate um, when appropriate. But you want to cover all of that up front. We have two more questions that are kind of specific. Okay. One of them is if the incorporated project is located here in Georgia and the fiscal sponsorship is located in New York, is the project subject to both states' jurisdictions? Huh. Um, you know, the project itself is subject to Georgia. Um, that's a hard question to answer because it could come up in so many different situations. Um, I think if you're the project, I'd be less concerned um, that the fiscal sponsor and the project can probably just focus on Georgia law if that helps. Um, other than the 990 reporting, is there any other requirements for advising IRS of your for advising IRS of your sponsorship agreement? You know, I think it's something you can handle just with the 990. Um, those funds are going to show up on there, but there's no form you have to fill in or anything letting them know that you're acting as a fiscal sponsor. That's a good question. Okay. Here's one more that you might need to read. It says, okay. Who exactly are the parties to the grant contract when a fiscal agency is used? If the only parties are the grantor and the fiscal agent, isn't the project entity just a contract relationship with a fiscal sponsor? Well, that's something you need to, again, lay out in advance. There are different ways to structure that, um, and you just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, I think it's certainly appropriate for the fiscal sponsor um, to be a party to the grant agreement and um, and the project, you know, as well. Um, but again, you just need to lay it out up front, make sure everybody else, everybody kind of has the same understanding about how this is going to work. Um, I think as a project, I would want to be a party to that contract. Um, but those questions raise one other thing I want to mention, which I, I see a lot of people use the term fiscal agent. Um, the appropriate term is really fiscal sponsor. Um, we don't want to confuse the relationship. Um, the 501c3 organization um, in this situation is the fiscal sponsor. They are sponsoring the project that doesn't have its 501c3 status. When you use the term agent, that brings up other legal connotations that really confuse the issue. Anything else? Okay. Um, this is my last slide, but I'm going to wrap up. But send any last minute questions real fast. Um, so the most important things you need to keep in mind, the missions must be consistent in order to protect the 501c3 status of the fiscal sponsor. You need to make sure that the work of the project is consistent with whatever the sponsor's charitable purpose is. Sponsor must retain control of funds. Um, the project has to give up some autonomy here in order to benefit from this arrangement, but the sponsor has to take responsibility for how these funds are used. Um, it's appropriate, as I said, for the sponsor to take a percentage of donations, to take some sort of administrative fee to cover the risks they're taking on and the um, additional work, frankly, they're taking on, and get something in writing up front um, that lays out this relationship. I've got some resources um, listed on this last page. Um, this sort of Bible everybody goes to is this Gregory Colvin book, Fiscal Sponsorship. Um, it lays out kind of six different ways you can set this up. Um, 
over and over again, I see fiscal sponsorships that don't really fit exactly into those six ways, somewhere kind of in the middle, but it's a really good book to get you thinking about the different issues. Um, and there's some resources on the Foundation Center and other websites as well I encourage you to look at. And finally, um, we've got more information about our services here, our website. Feel free to contact us uh, for more information. Um, one viewer asks, can an organization that has its 501c, have its 501c3, have a sponsor to do books, insurance, audit, tax filing, etc.? Is that fiscal sponsorship or a different relationship? That's a good question. That's actually one of the relationship laid out in that book I just mentioned. Um, it's not something I commonly see. Most of the time when I see people looking for fiscal sponsorship, it's because they don't have their 501c3 status. You can structure that, and actually I have a client that does that for other organizations, um, even though the project, so to speak, have their own 501c3 status. They basically um, farm out their administrative tasks, their bookkeeping, their payroll, all that stuff to this other 501c3. Again, you need to look and make sure that you know your missions are consistent, probably. Um, but that is an entirely appropriate structure. And, and according to this book, it's a fiscal sponsorship also. Okay. Well, that's all. All right. Thank you very much.